Air ahead of the National Park Service, Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site, Terrence Roberts oral history interview produced by Little Rock Central High School, NHS. Screen fades to black and then Terrence Roberts appears on My the screen. My name is Johanna Miller Lewis and I'm professor of history at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. And today I'm interviewing Terrence Roberts, one of the members of the Little Rock Nine. Today is August 29th, 2005. So we'll start at the beginning. If you could just uh, tell me about when and where you were born. I was born in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, of all places, in uh, 1941. My birth date is December 3rd. And at that time, we were living at 2010 Pulaski Street. Tell me a little bit about um, what your home and neighborhood was like when you were growing up. I'm not sure if I can remember far back to the years on Pulaski Street. I, I know I was born there, but my, my recollection about the neighborhood comes at uh, 1611 Izzard because we moved there. Uh, I guess I was around four or five years old. And one thing I can remember, the neighborhood was full of kids, uh, kids all over the place. So there was a constant uh, party. <laughs> with the young kids, uh, we played we played hard all day long. And then uh, we moved across the street from 1611 to 1624. And we were there for, for quite a long time. In fact, I, I started school from that address, the 1624 address, and went to Gibbs Elementary. And I can remember just having a good time, mostly. And from Gibbs, you went on to Dunbar? Right, went to Dunbar. By that time, Dunbar was a junior high school. Mm -hmm. So I did all of my seventh, eighth, and ninth grade tenure there. And I left Dunbar to go to Horace Mann, the uh, high school. And I was there for my 10th grade year. Spent one year at Horace Mann. And then the following year was the year we went to Central. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your family, your parents and your, your siblings. There were uh, seven of us siblings. Uh, my parents were uh, William Roberts and Margaret Roberts. They were both uh, high school graduates. My dad later finished a course at the uh, Dunbar Junior College, two-year course there. He was a shoemaker. He was a craftsman. And he was a workaholic. He, I never knew him to have any fewer than three jobs, oh. always working. And uh, my mom worked hard also. She ran a catering business. She ran the business out of the home. Hmm. She uh, and a partner of hers, a woman named Lois, Lois Jordan, who lived here in Arkansas and Little Rock as well, the two of them worked together. And all of us kids, well, not all, little kids weren't involved, but the older of the seven siblings were helpers in the catering business. Uh, so as a result, we all learned how to cook very early on, which I found out was a, a very nice skill to have. <laughs> so if you could name all the siblings, please. Oh, certainly. Uh, my, I'm number two in line. My older sister is Jerita, uh, Jerita Smith at this point. Jarita is uh, two years older. She was born in 1939. Then I came along in 41. In 1943, my sister Beverly was born. And for a long time, we were the kids, the three of us, until 1950. And then Janice was born. And that was a bit of a shock because you know how kids are. We have an established family unit. And here comes this interloper. But we rallied around her and we, we treated her like our little plaything, our doll. And she had a good time. So for about three years, then she was the, the baby of the family. Then in 1953, William Edward was born. And then in 1954, Jerome Herman. And then in 1957, Margaret Elizabeth. And that was the end of all of that. So, but the seven of us constitute the family now. Uh, were there other 
um, relatives living in Little Rock or Arkansas that oh, yeah, you were yeah. especially close to? Lots of relatives. In fact, growing up very young, my grandmother was alive. Her name was uh, Elizabeth Jeter. She was a woman who I remember as being very tough, uh, very focused and disciplined, uh, especially on young kids. <laughs> and my, my mom's, a lot of my mom's cousins and uh, other relations, aunts and uncles were living here at the time. My dad's family had already moved from Little Rock to Los Angeles. So most of them were gone, although we, we kept in touch with them via telephone and letter, but we didn't see them as much as we saw most of my, my mom's family. My mom's uh, younger sister uh, lived here. She eventually moved to North Little Rock. And in fact, just, she died just a couple of years ago mm -hmm. uh, in North Little Rock. Especially with having seven kids around the house, um, I'm curious to sort of know what, what family life was like. I mean, any specific memories that, st that stick out? Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that sticks out, and it's, it's, it's sort of a retrospective thing, because uh, later in life, I couldn't figure out how my parents managed to feed and clothe the seven kids, uh, <laughs> given the cost as I, that I now know as a parent myself. But they did it. They, they managed to do it seemingly with some ease. We always had what we needed. Always enough food, always enough clothing. That, that's an amazing feat. And looking back, I still haven't been able to figure it out. At the time, of course, we didn't think anything about that. As kids, you just have expectations for having all these things, and, and there they are. So that, that stands out for me. And so would your family have been you know, a fairly regular family in the, in the neighborhood that you were talking about? I think so. Yeah. I, I think so, uh, absolutely. Uh, one, thing, one thing that, that made us stand out was that my mom, not so much my dad, but my mom was a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so we went to church on Saturday while everybody else was going on Sunday. And what that resulted in, because I wanted to be with my friends, was I wound up going to church two days a week. Saturday and Sunday. So I got uh, pretty much overdosed on, on religion. Did, do you remember having any specific aspirations um, for the future? As a, as a kid yeah. growing up? Um, I don't think I had any specific aspirations. I do remember being asked in school about career choice and that sort of thing. And I would pick something different and unusual each time just because I wanted to try it out to see how it would feel, variety of things. And in fact, I was not certain about what I would eventually do until much later in life as a college student uh, when it became necessary really to bring some focus to my life. In fact, I started out in college as a chemistry major and, and the combination of things, not the least of which was uh, the really difficult chemistry one course, I decided that I probably need to keep looking. Uh, and eventually I found psychology, which was like a natural for me, uh, simply because I've always had an affinity for and a tremendous interest in people. So psychology was easy for me. And in fact, at this point now, as a professional psychologist, uh, it's never been like work. It's always been like having fun. That's the way to do it. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, society uh, in Little Rock when you were um, growing up. Um, how segregated was your life? Well, you know, it was segregated to uh, a very extreme degree uh, with some caveats. For instance, we lived in a neighborhood that was not racially segregated. There were white families in the neighborhood um, I remember uh, at one point, uh, we had moved from Izzard to Howard Street, and all the houses on Howard Street were filled with black families, but across the alley, facing east on Park Street, all the families were white. And we interacted with each other in the alley as we put out our trash, or as we used the alleyway to go down to the corner market, which at that time was owned by a Chinese family, which was very unusual 
and Little Rock at that time. But uh, everything else was very strictly segregated. We were in separate schools, separate social institutions. Uh, riding the public transportation meant that black people had to ride from the back of the bus uh, forward and that sort of thing. So I was introduced very early on to the, the rules of a segregated society. And they were fairly harsh, harsh to the extreme. There were signs on, on the public accommodations, for instance, uh, bathrooms said men, women, colored. And you didn't even have the distinction of gender for that group. I always questioned that, even as a young child, but I never got satisfactory answers. Because most of the adults in my life said, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do about it. It's the law of the land. And that last part was especially galling because they were right. It was the law of the land. This was the law, that states had the right to discriminate based on racial group membership. That never made sense to me. When, um when would you, if at, any, if at any time, interact with whites when you were growing up? Oh, all the time. And that was another one of the crazy yeah. rules of uh, segregation. As long as you were aware of and abided by the, the social rules, then you could freely associate. For instance, my, my mom, in her catering business, had mainly white customers since they had discretionary income. Black people didn't have any money. So as a result of that, we were often in the homes of white families. As kids, we were the helpers. We were preparing food and cleaning up and this sort of thing. And we could enter the homes. We could never enter by the front door. We had to enter by the back door. But once inside, we had to run of the place. But we could not leave by the front door. We had to exit through the back door. It was a very interesting system uh, <laughs> altogether. Uh, I had a small business in town, I raked leaves in the fall and cut lawns in the summer. And again, most of my customers were white. So I interacted fairly freely uh, with white people given the rules that were in place. But even at the places where I worked, I had to be very careful not to go near the front door. Again, it was back door entry or walk down the side of the house, do the driveway or whatever to get the tools and mow the lawn and, and rake and that sort of thing. Where, um, where did you do most of your um, lawn cutting and yard work? Uh, around the area near Central, see, because we lived in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so on, uh, on Park Street, on Wolf, uh, those, those streets around there, uh, that's where most of it happened. A lot of people have um, made the comment that they were sort of surprised about what happened in, in 57 because Little Rock was such a progressive city. It, I mean, oh, I've heard that too. I've heard that too. How does that strike you, though? I well, mean, it it strikes me as as being uh, very short sighted. Yeah. You know, folk who who really didn't know the whole story. You know, when you say Little Rock was a progressive city, that in context meant that the rules of segregation were being followed rather smoothly, and uh, there weren't too many friction points progressive in the sense that things would remain the same. The status quo would prevail. And nobody expected that to change. See, the challenge to the status quo, I think, was the surprising thing. Um, it wasn't expected to happen here in Little Rock or any other place for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely not. So things like the library being desegregated in I know, like 55 or 56 you know, weren't big things. The well, well they, they were big in the sense that we, and the same thing with the buses, you mm -hmm. know, we saw these as being signs that things were gradually ch changing, that the old system was gradually eroding. Uh, that, that just made sense to me, you know. My expectation was all this stuff will be dismantled at some point. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know when. You know, as a young child, I had a hard time making sense out of it because I had all of these inputs and all of these experiences of working with all kinds of people, black and white. And see, I quickly ascertained from a very young age that there was a fiction being perpetuated here, the fiction being that white people were superior and black people were less so. 
That, by my own personal experience, was proven untrue. So I never bought into that one. And so I was puzzled about why so many people seem to, to buy into that one. Uh, st I'm still puzzled because even today there are people who buy into that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no supportable basis for it. Uh, it, it strikes me that um, one of the ways you possibly would have understood um, that this progressive idea is, or the idea that whites are superior over blacks um, was, a, was a fiction it would have to do with um, not only your own education but also your parents' education at Dunbar. Right. Um, what, I mean, do your parents talk about Dunbar? Do you, what do you remember of your experiences at well, Dunbar? Well, I, I remember very well that the situation at Dunbar was quite unique in a sense because in response to the rigid segregation, a lot of young black people who had gone away to college or university someplace returned to Little Rock, found out that they could not find employment in any chosen profession. So for instance, if a person had gone away to study accounting, there were no accounting positions available. Or if a person studied uh, chemistry, there were no chemical firms or plants or laboratories where he or she could work. But those same people were qualified to teach by virtue of the fact that they had some college diploma. They could teach school or they could work for the U.S. Postal Service, which by then was no longer uh, segregated. Many of them opted to become teachers. So we, the kids, had the benefit of these well-trained teachers. Um, this group of teachers were very clear about their mission, which was to prepare us as kids for life in a society. So they went out of their way. They really did. Our education went far beyond the assigned curriculum. We learned about the society as a whole. We learned about things economic, political. We learned about policies and practices throughout society, uh, institutions and why they were in existence. And that was really helpful, very helpful. It helped to, to maintain some balance. So then when we would hear rhetoric of segregation, we would hear the voices of oppression and so forth, we could put it in context. And we knew, for instance, that it had nothing whatsoever to do with us. Mm -hmm. So there was never any danger of internalizing that stuff. Uh, we had a buffer as a result of having been at Dunbar. And you probably know about the legacy of Dunbar in terms of who the graduates turned out to be. Mm -hmm. It's a remarkable story. And, and that was continuing uh, as I was there. <coughs> so I, I think that that experience, um, I've talked about that in other places, and a lot of people said that's very unique mm -hmm. for some place like Little Rock or some place in the South, certainly. A absolutely. Do you remember um, when Dunbar ceased being a high school and was demoted to junior high status? You know, just based on my own um, going there, I, I think it probably had to have happened between 1947 and probably 1952, somewhere along it, there. Um, actu it's actual, the last graduation from Dunbar is, I think, June of 55. Oh, okay. Actually. So, yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah, I entered elementary school in 47. Six years there, that would have been 53. Mm -hmm. So, and then I went three years to junior high, mm -hmm. 54, 55, 56. Okay, that all sort of fits. Um, well, the, the reason I'm asking is that um, there's some indication that this um, announcing there was going to be um, a new high school and, um, and Horace Mann sort of um, coming online, um, not exactly when it was supposed to, in fact, the, the first year Horace Mann was in existence, the classes were held at Dunbar. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but that Horace Mann was not a particularly well-received development in the education, uh, you know, black education in Little Rock. And I was wondering if... Now, you know, actually, I don't know too much about that one. Okay. Uh, I was aware that this shift was coming. Um, and I remember a number of people who weren't pleased about it at all. 
uh, namely because Dunbar had such a legacy, and then why I cut that off. Uh, I think I was too young to have an opinion uh, about it, um, but I remember some of that. Um, sort of continuing on on, on education, um, when you were at um, Dunbar and Horace Mann, um, did you have, prior to 57, did you, I mean, did you think a lot about Little Rock Senior High School or, or Central? Did you have an opinion about it? Well, I, I certainly thought about it because uh, living where we lived at that time, as a high school person, we lived on Howard Street, 2301. Uh, we would actually walk by Central on our way to the bus, because we usually would catch the bus at the corner of 16th and Park. That's where the school is. That was the bus we were taking out to Central, I mean to Horace Mann. We'd have to ride downtown and transfer to go out to Horace Mann. And I always thought, well, this is rather insane. Here's a school right here. Why are we leaving this one? Uh, but I understood why, you know, because I was by that time well informed about the rules of segregation. Um, did it strike you that Central was a better school than where you were going to school? I didn't think of it in those terms. Um, and, and even later, I didn't think of it in those terms. I thought of it as different in the sense that it was for white kids only. Mm -hmm. But honestly, um, and I don't know where this came from, uh, I've never had that much esteem for American high schools at all, because they all seem to be universally bad. But I also have known that in order to, to prosper in those settings, the individual student has to take charge of his or her own education. So in spite of what the school is or what it has to offer, that the education can continue. So I didn't have any expectations that Central would be better than, than uh, Horace Mann, but it would simply be more of the same. And it turned out pretty much to be that way, although the year I was at Central was so chaotic it's hard to measure. You know. mm -hmm. Did, uh, do you remember the um, Brown versus Board decision being handed down? Oh was yeah, it? absolutely. Uh, the one thing that stands out is shortly afterwards, I think it was the year following, the buses in Little Rock were desegregated. And I recall on one of my morning trips to Horace Mann, one of the black students, I forgot who it was, took a newspaper which had the headline about the buses being desegregated and plopped it down in the lap of the bus driver as he walked on and took his seat in the front. <laughs> I remember that one. Uh, so yeah, we were aware. And it, seemed to portend that perhaps things were changing. That this decision, which basically uh, invalidated the uh, Plessy decision of 1896, Plessy decision said it's constitutional to discriminate. The Brown decision said, well, now it's not. It's not constitutional anymore. OK, I said, uh, now is the time to, to move forward and think about things changing. I was fairly optimistic. When were you asked about um, the possibility of whether you wanted to attend Central? That actually happened sometime in the spring of that same year, 1957. This was during the uh, 55, no, the 56-57 school year. So during the spring of that year, we were asked about whether or not we, meaning the kids at Central, I mean at Horace Mann High, uh, representatives from the school board came and outlined this plan of desegregation at Central. And it was only going to be one high school, it would be Central High, and it would only be one way. It would be black kids going to Central. So I heard that and I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is more of the, the shifting and changing that has been in the air. So they talked about the plan. I listened. I thought, OK. So they asked for volunteers. And you know, there were a number of volunteers. I can't remember the exact number, but many more than nine. So we, we all got on the list, so to speak. That's when I first heard about it. 
Um, well, the initial lawsuit uh, that the NAACP brought against the school board, um, Aaron V. Cooper, there were 35 students listed um, in that uh, in that lawsuit. Uh, in that lawsuit. Um, one of the stories that has been um, perpetuated about um, the nine going to Central is that you all were a very carefully hand-picked bunch and vetted for stable home life and um, your study habits and how well you were doing um, at, at school. Um, how, how true is that? You know, I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, the irony is, I don't know much about it. Uh, I spent most of that summer traveling, so I wasn't in town a lot. Um, I was gone with a friend of mine, and um, my parents told me that they were interviewed by the school board, and I am sure there was some checking of records and this one thing and another. Um, I didn't pay much attention to that, that whole process. It had never occurred to me that I might be deselected <laughs> after I had volunteered. So I imagine I made it through whatever screening uh, they had in place. Mm -hmm. And you know, retrospectively, I, I don't think that there would not have been some screening. Uh, I think there was so much concern about what would happen and how this would be perceived and what would be the consequence of going forward if you had a bunch of kids who were willing to uh, react and, and fight and that sort of thing. Um, were you or your family um, members of the Little Rock chapter of the NAACP? No, we were not. So um, did you have um, any connection with Daisy Bates prior to 57? No, not prior to 57. Only I, I knew about the Bates uh, through their paper, their paper mm -hmm. the state press. I knew who they were, uh, Daisy and LC, but uh, we didn't have any real contact. Mm -hmm. One of the other mysteries, I think, um, surrounding September 57 or even before that is um, the way in which Daisy Bates somehow became um, the spokesman for the Nine and, and sort of so-called uh, mentor. Uh, to, to you all. Do you have any recollection of how that or why that came about? I don't, I don't know exactly how or why, but my, my thought was that because things had gotten to such a point of chaos, uh, the school board, after putting forth the initial plan, seemingly because of the uh, negative response by the citizenry, were thrown off base actually wound up <clears throat> with a leadership vacuum. And so there was this idea floating around, but nobody sort of taking the reins. And I think because of the, the history that the NAACP brings and the fact that Daisy Bates was on the scene, it was a natural mix. That it was just the confluence of those forces, the lack of leadership. And here's a person who is part of an organization that wants to lead in the direction of desegregating society, so why not put these together? That makes sense to me. The fine details, I don't know. But <laughs> it, it all seemed to happen that way. And then Daisy, uh, to me, sort of assumed uh, a very strong leadership role. And we, I can recall uh, meeting at her house, for instance, the nine of us, with all kinds of people. It was there where we met Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King Jr. and people like that. And it, it all seemed to be flowing in a direction that made sense. What was it like meeting Thurgood Marshall? Oh, that was pretty astounding, <laughs> you know. He was uh, a really remarkable man. And then uh, later on, uh, having met him there, of course, I stayed in touch and talked with him on a number of occasions, and he always had stories. There's one thing that I liked about him. He could tell stories uh, about everything. He and Wiley Branton, uh, Wiley was from Pine Bluff, but the two of them were just filled with anecdotes from their experience of trying to desegregate this country. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you find out, or when did you find out about? Excuse me, the keys are in my pocketbook. Oh, no, I don't need the keys. I just, there was no expert to grab over from the history department. 
Okay. And do I just need to hit play? Yeah. Okay. That's just a stick the video in, hit play, and it should work. Yeah, as long as it's, you may need to make sure the VCR is connected to the thing. Okay. okay. Sorry. That's all right. And my keys are in there if you need them later. Okay. All right. Um, oh, uh, how and when did you find out that Governor Faubus decided um, to uh, call out the guard to keep you all from going to school? You know, that happened very late in the game. Uh, we found out literally the night before school was to start through a televised announcement. Mm -hmm. okay. My initial thought was this is probably his way of trying to avoid bloodshed that he will, under the guise of having these guys there to keep us out, maintain his status with his segregationist followers, but that his real point was to provide protection for us. Extremely naive, I know. But, <laughs> so I was not afraid when I walked up to school that day. I, I can recall leaving home with no fear whatsoever. I had a pencil tucked behind one ear and I just walked up to Central High into the midst of absolute chaos. I mean, mobs of people yelling and screaming and I didn't know what to make of it. And still I wasn't afraid, it was odd. Uh, but then a, a cadre of reporters and photographers just sort of descended upon me and they began to pepper me with questions, you know. And I answered a few of them, but I was looking around. And uh, it was interesting because Elizabeth had already arrived. She had already walked that gauntlet. So she was sitting on a bus bench. I couldn't even see her because of the density of the mob. And then one reporter told me that she was over there. So I made my way over to the bench and talked with her a little bit. She wasn't really an, an, in a state where she could carry on much conversation. Mm -hmm. I suggested that maybe she should just walk home with me, go to my house. But then she said, well, even if I get to your house, then I've got to somehow get to my house from there, so I might as well get the bus here. So she waited for the bus. Uh, meanwhile, I made my way back through the mob and started walking home. And a, a white guy ran after me. And I thought, oh boy. So I turned around and uh, assumed a posture of defense or whatever, and he waved that off saying, no, no, no. He says, I want you to know that I'm a friend. I, I don't agree with all of this stuff. And uh, not everybody in Little Rock is against you. And I thanked him. And by that time, my dad was walking up because he had seen this stuff on television. And he walked up to meet me and we went home. That was the first day. Not a very propitious start. N no, no. So there wasn't a lot of um, organization to that day? Okay. No, not a lot. I, in thinking about it now, the, uh, the narrative or the national narrative suggests that uh, Elizabeth didn't get a phone call. Right. Well, I didn't either. Right. <laughs> so I don't know the whatever happened there. Uh, then the report goes on to say that the other eight, which would have included me, but actually it would have been the other seven, if that in fact happened, I suppose it did arrived in mass to be turned away the same way Elizabeth and I were turned away. Mm -hmm. But uh, for whatever reason, we all were turned away. And we were out of school for probably another three weeks uh, before uh, we went back in that uh, one time under the protection of the Little Rock police, which was perhaps the most dangerous day of my life. Uh, because had the mob been a little quicker, we might have been all killed. We got out just in time. Uh, we had to be spirited out from an underground garage. And you know, it's fortunate. The architecture of the school was such that we had an out. There was an underground garage. So we were able to be taken down there, invisible to the mob, and then we sped through them before they could react. But they, even so, then they had to go in there and search to see that we were gone. So we figured, can't do that again. Uh, so the next time we had the army, Eisenhower had finally sent in the military to take us to school. Um, moving backwards just a, just a little bit um, on the uh, trying to get in on September, uh, September 4th, um, do you remember if uh, Daisy or Elsie Bates was around that day? I think... Uh, I don't know for certain. 
But I think uh, with the, the seven kids who came as a group, maybe Daisy was with them? That, that's foggy. I, I don't remember. I don't know. We have Elsie in a photograph uh -huh. from that day. Right. Um, and that, of course, does not mesh with what um, Mrs. Bates wrote in her book. Right. So it's always been sort of a question. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Who's, yeah, it'd be interesting. There, there may be some other news photographs, because mm -hmm. I'm sure there were a lot of shots. If there, any of them survive, we might be able to figure it out, but I don't know. And you know, as I think about it now, I can't remember what, what the plans were, or if there were solid yeah. plans for that first day. Uh, how did you um, find out, n you know, not only that the um, army was was coming in, um, but that sort of what the specifics would be of their uh, escorting you to school on the 25th? Wow, I do remember that we had a meeting with uh, the general Edwin Walker, who explained how things were going to be that day, that day, first day we went to school. Uh, prior to that, uh, I think I learned about the troops coming through the, again, through television, that they are coming. And their mission is to take these kids to school. Uh, and then later, there was some, I even forgot what place, it may have been at Daisy's house, where we met with the uh, General Walker, who, who told us, and, and we were, I think, we were picked up at Daisy's house. Uh, and we were loaded into this uh, army station wagon for a trip up to the central. What do you remember about your classes um, at, at central and, and sort of how you were treated both by students as well as teachers? Wow. Uh, well, it was, it was quickly apparent that we were not a welcome bunch. Uh, we were assigned to classes, we were assigned to homerooms based on our class standing, sophomore, junior, senior, and then within those categories we were divided up alphabetically. So because our names were all different, the five of us who were juniors were in separate classes. Uh, and then the three sophomores, the same thing, and then Ernie by himself as a senior. I walked into class Every class I walked into that day, a contingent of students got up and left. I can't remember how many, but a sizable number. Basically, uh, and they gave me the benefit of their best thinking about me and people like me, <laughs> and uh, gave me all sorts of advice, travel advice included. And they said, we're not coming back as long as you're here. And I can recall thinking at the time, this is very odd because this is an opportunity to educate oneself. Why would you throw that away? But they left, and, and they were true to their word. I, you know, as far as I can tell, they, they never came back. Teachers were afraid. I could see the fear. We were all afraid. Uh, many of them offered minimal gestures of acceptance, smile here and there. But they were very cautious, too, because the word was out. You could tell the word was out. If you are friendly to those kids, we will do things to you. You're on our list. Um, my English teacher, and I can't remember her name, but it would be easy to find in the records. She was so terribly unwelcoming. She said to me one day, why do you want to come to our school? Why don't you go back to your own school? Which, again, I thought odd, you know, because this is an educator. How, how can you say that sort of a thing? I didn't know what to say to her, so I didn't say anything. <laughs> there were a few teachers who actually went out of their way, in spite of the social pressure, to be helpful. Uh, my algebra teacher, uh, again, I can't remember her name, but a woman who said to the class when I first walked in, there will be no nonsense in this class. We're here to learn algebra. And that, that, was, that was so nice because it meant I could relax in her class. Uh, other classes, I had to be constantly vigilant and watchful because all sorts of things would happen. 
And uh, you could never be certain that a, any appeal to the teacher would work. Uh, it's an English teacher, case in point, you know. She never saw anything. And I would say, this happened and that happened, and she said, I didn't see it. And that, to me, was shorthand for, if I don't see it, then I don't have to do anything. So I was on my own in her class. That's a difficult learning environment. Yes, yes. But you have to position yourself strategically. So I chose a corner so I could see <laughs> everything around me. Check on the computer. Okay. They may have muted it. All right. All right. That's all right. There have been sort of numerous stories and takes on the white students at Central. And were they helpful? Were they not helpful? Mm -hmm. Were they, you know, out to out to get you? And um, so first I'd like to ask about was there, was there or were there um, students that were in fact sort of out to get you? Oh yeah, without doubt, without doubt. Um, I, I suppose a more salient question would be uh, how could there be any student who was willing to confront all of that pressure and befriend us? because the pressure was on. You know, any student who reached out to help us was quickly labeled nigger lover. That was the label of choice. And once a student picked up that label, he or she wasn't safe in that environment. And so initial attempts to befriend us lessened very quickly. A few students managed to resist all of that. Uh, Robin Woods stands out, a very remarkable young woman. And she basically said, uh, I don't care what the pressure is. This is not right. She was uh, one of very, very few who were able to, to stand up and say that. Uh, but, you know, in the main, students, and, and I tried to reason it out, and I figured that they were honestly of the opinion that we, the nine, were in the wrong. We were doing the wrong thing. We shouldn't be there. We had no place there. We were messing up everything. And so, given that way of thinking, there was no real compunction about doing things to get us out of there. So I think the, the activities they engaged in were primarily designed to discourage us so that we would leave. And basically, that, that seemed to be true because when, when Minnie Jean was expelled, the little card that was circulated, and some of those still exist, uh, one down, eight to go, that was clear evidence. This was the plan, get them all out. And for the rest of the white students who maintained that they didn't do anything? Well, it's quite true in a sense that they, they didn't do anything overt. Uh, although, I bumped into a guy at the Little Rock Airport not too long ago who identified himself as having been in my PE class at Central. And I was the only black kid in there with about 60 or 70 boys. And I caught hell every day. And when he introduced himself uh, as having been in that class, I gave a start. And he says, oh, no. He says, I wasn't one of the ones beating up on you. But he says, I was one of the ones standing by watching and not doing anything. And he told quite a story. He said, you know, for all these years, I felt badly that I didn't step in and help you. And it was a very honest and genuine expression. I thought, wow, this is, this is good. It would have been great had he been able to come to that realization earlier. Uh, I could have used some help at the time. But yeah, it was, it was so crazy because given the climate, individuals could do things with impunity. Nobody was going to tell on them. So if I got hit from behind, if somebody threw the baseball when I wasn't looking, they could always say, well, he was on the team. He should have been catching the ball, you know, whatever. There, there was always this. And there would be support for that version. There would be no support for the version that this kid had singled me out when I wasn't looking for just that opportunity to throw the ball. Um, yeah, it was, it was that sort of climate, you know. And, and we, we caught hell from as many people as possible, it seemed. You know, even though I know there's, there's some denial at this point that uh, we didn't do it. 
Uh, <laughs> some maybe somebody, kind. Somebody did this. <laughs> I've got to, got to figure it out. Who were these folk? <laughs> Was there a marked change in the atmosphere at school once the 101st pulled out and you had National Guardsmen again? Not really, because uh, uh, the National Guardsmen were just as professional in their duties as were the 101st guys. Uh, these were all young men. They were not very old. They were maybe 18, 19, 20. And, you know, there was a level of fear also with them, as it was with the 101st. That was very instructional to me. Uh, fear is so universal, you know. But no, they they were they were very protective, and made certain that you know as little as possible happened. I can recall uh, uh, being about to exit one door there at Central. The guard ran up to me and said, "No, no, don't go out that way because there's a bunch of guys waiting for you." So he escorted me out of another door. That sort of a thing. How did your friends and people in the neighborhood react to your being um, one of the students at Central? Well, you know, we had a, we had a chance to, to interact a lot with our peer group at Horace Mann because we were uh, not allowed to do anything at Central. We had to sign an affidavit that we would not be involved in anything extracurricular. So being locked out of all the social activities, we simply moved over to Horace Mann to participate in social activities. So we were there and we were able to talk and my friends were really concerned about my safety and well-being. Just terribly concerned. They wanted, they were always wanting to know, well, who did that and we'll go get him for you, you know, that sort of thing. And I would always say, no, no, we don't need to do that. But that was a measure of how much they were concerned uh, about what was going on with us. Uh, and I think they, they actually felt that we were doing something that needed to be done and that whatever they could do to be supportive, uh, they would do. Uh, after the school year, um, the 57-58 school year um, ended, um, what did you do? Did you go to New York that summer? Yes. Uh, Ernie and I went to New York together. We both worked for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. We were card-carrying union members. Ernie worked in the administration. I worked in a warehouse. And we, we roomed together. We roomed together in a Queens, pooled our resources, and had a great summer. And in fact, I was so enthralled with New York. I wanted to, once I found out that Central was going to be closed the following year, I, I thought, well, why not stay in New York? I could go to school here. I could go to high school here. My parents, however, were, were reluctant because I didn't have any, any relatives or friends there. And so they said, if you go anywhere, you've got to go to Los Angeles because your dad's family is there. So that's uh, what happened. But that was, that was a great summer in New York. We spent the whole summer there working and enjoying the uh, activities in New York. So when you um, went to Los Angeles to go to school, um, was it just you or did your whole family move? Initially, it was just me. I went out about August of uh, 1958 and enrolled in school. I wound up going to uh, Los Angeles High School. And uh, December, my, by that time, my mom and dad had decided they might as well move too. So they moved the entire family in December of that year. And actually, um, my older sister, who was at college, had gone away to college. Also uh, moved out to LA. So all of us were there. And essentially that's been home base since Little Rock. How hard was it on the rest of your family? I mean, the business at Central? Yeah. Uh, pretty hard, uh, especially my parents. Uh, my siblings, I think, were uh, not old enough to really absorb the true nature of what was going on. But my parents got really uh, psychologically beaten up. Um, hate calls, hate mail, drive-bys, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the telephone was a real monster in our house because y you could be certain, basically, that if you picked up the phone, 
uh, there would be some racist voice, just vile invective most of the time. And my mom told me a story that was really chilling. She told me this story some 20 years after the fact. We were living in Los Angeles. And she said that during that time, during that year, somebody called her up and told her that I had been beaten, savagely beaten, probably to the point of death, that the caller said he probably won't live for half an hour, and gave her all the gory details. And, and that sent her over the edge, I mean, psychologically. But somehow she managed to get up to the school that day, and the principal actually brought her down to my classroom, and she looked in there and saw that was OK. Nothing had happened. And then she went back home. But she didn't, didn't say anything about it, never said a word until that point 20 years later. It was an amazing thing because I could, I could feel the chill bumps when she told me. And I also realized in that moment that I had no clue about the total cost she had to pay. Uh, and as a parent, looking at it for, through the eyes of myself being a parent, I thought, my God, I don't know that I could, could do that. I, you know, my own children, having gone through that, and knowing what they would have to go through, I know there's no way I would say yes. No way. <laughs> so, and then for my parents to have had the foresight to be as protective as they were, because they didn't tell me. My mom would literally burn up hate mail before I got home. So as a result, even though I have some hate mail in my papers, I don't have nearly all of it, you know. And when I ask about that, she was, you know, adamant in her response. She said, I don't care what you say, I'm burning it up. <laughs> so How helpful or not were, were the administrators at Central to the, to the parents? I mean, we hear a lot about them having meeting, uh, Huckabee and Matthews having meetings with uh, Daisy Bates, but we just don't hear that much about the, the parents. They were not active figures in my life uh, at all. Um, you know, as I recall, the administration and the teachers were sort of like walking a tightrope that year. They weren't certain what to do. They were afraid, as I mentioned before. And they were also products of this environment. Mm -hmm. So I would not expect them to do much more than what they did, which was to sort of see where the wind's going to blow. Um, they were not, certainly not proactive in saying, this is going to happen. We're going to make it happen. Far from that. Far from that. Uh, there was probably a, a great relief on their parts when the school was closed, because they could, they could reduce their own fear level. I mean, you know, from a personal standpoint. Now, I don't know. Uh, this is all speculation on my part, but I don't know how they may have felt about the fact that the educational process had ground to a halt. That's the part that would have got my attention, you see. Uh, these other things to me are, uh, by that I mean this whole notion of racial segregation and all that stuff. Even though it was a given, it was irrational and illogical, so I never really gave it much credit. But I did think that education was and is important. And if you would close an institution in the name of segregation, that really made no sense. You know? And I would think they would be appalled by that. I certainly hope so. Tell me a little bit about, um, or a lot, about your, your life um, after Central. I mean, you said that you um, went to LA during the last year and started school there, and your, and your family came out. but. Yeah, that was actually quite interesting because L.A. was a, um, of course, very different from, from Little Rock. In fact, the school I attended, Los Angeles High School, at that time was one of the more completely integrated schools in the city. It happened to be in a neighborhood that had not yet divided itself up into monoracial groupings. People were congregated together. And we had uh, black people, white people, Asians, Latinos, people from just about every walk of life you could imagine. And LA High was a large school. And I came in under the radar. Nobody really knew who I was, so there was no fanfare. So I was able to get in there and sort of start figuring things out and meeting people and, and talking to them. And what was, what was instructive to me was, in spite of the fact that you had these uh, conditions where the school was desegregated and you could ignore any possible lines of separation, the lines were there. 
the lines were there because students would congregate based on racial group membership. Uh, now, here's an interesting thing in terms of how I saw things. I thought, this is not something that you have to do, so why would you? <laughs> and so when you look at the, the yearbook from my graduating class, 1959, my face shows up in various places. Often it's the only black face in the crowd. Uh, and, and that to me was symbolic of what this whole thing was about. You have the opportunity, but you also have choice. You can choose to do. And I, I'm a big advocate of choice. You know, I, only, I just want to have choice. I want to have the options. You know, looking back on my life in Little Rock, I would have preferred to have the option to segregate myself or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? I think, fine, if you want to segregate, that's up to you. But I would prefer to have the option be mine. So, you know, I can make the choice. Forced segregation. You know, in LA High, we didn't have forced segregation. But we had segregation by choice. And I understand that too. I understand because I, I talked to all the kids to find out what was going on. A number of them simply had no experience with other folk from different groups, right. other racial groups, had no experience whatsoever. So all they had going for them were assumptions or stereotypes. Um, I've always rejected those. My own assumptions and stereotypes, of course, they, they, you know, they're worthless. You just have to have first-hand information. Um, I also had to learn racism LA style, which was quite different from Little Rock. Uh, I have a very good singing voice, so I joined the choir, the choral group at uh, LA High. I was excited about it. And every year there's a musical production. I wanted to have the lead role in Kiss Me Kate. The choir director, who was a white woman, pulled me aside and explained to me that that was impossible. That could not happen. She stopped just short of saying it's because you're black, but the message was very clear. Uh, because of the way th the roles were assigned, I began to look closely and I, oh, okay, I get it. That's racism LA style. You don't speak of it, but you do it. Oh, okay, so having absorbed that, then I was able to, to navigate the racial terrain in LA with much ease. And, and that's true wherever I go. You have to first learn the rules and then you're fine once you know the rules. You can then opt to confront the rules in terms of trying to change them or not, but you, at least you know. You absolutely know. So it was an exciting experience. <laughs> And after high school, then uh, college. Went to college. I started off at UCLA and had a great time there. But I was sort of confused about exactly what I wanted to do. And I actually stopped college after a couple of years and worked for a while. Then I got back to school. And this time I enrolled in uh, California State University at Los Angeles and picked up a degree in sociology. And at that time, I was so fascinated by people, and I thought I wanted to become a sociologist. I wanted to study people, figure out why they were making the choices they were making in terms of you know, living in society. But the more I got to know sociologists, the more discouraged I became because it seemed like the sociologists were content to be researchers, but not activists. They would make forays into the community and gather data, and then go back to the university and analyze it and issue reports. And I thought, mm, no. So I, I went into social work, thinking I would become some sort of a social activist. But when I got into social work school, I found out that the majority of my classmates were interested in becoming psychotherapists. Because psycho I mean, social workers can be licensed to practice as clinicians. And that's where they were headed. They used to talk about this in the halls. They wanted to have practices in Brentwood, 150 bucks an hour. Mm. And I thought, well, psychotherapy has some appeal, but I thought if I'm really going to do this, I should go all the way with it. So I enrolled in a program in psychology and picked up a doctorate and then got into the practice of psychology. And uh, that is where I've been since then. But you've done some teaching. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, right away, as soon as I got out of my program in psychology, I took a teaching position at a small college up in uh, Northern California, Pacific Union College. And uh, I stayed there a, a few years, and, but then I, I moved down to a mental hospital in the same area 
and start directing a mental health program. So I was, I directed that program for about 10 years. And then I took an administrative job at my uh, old school, UCLA, in the School of Social Work. I became an assistant dean. And I was there about 10 years. And then I retired. Uh, I officially retired from UCLA in 1993. But I you know, had all this time and energy, so I took a job as chair of the psychology department at Antioch University in LA. And uh, that was exciting at first, but then the work became overwhelming as the department chair. I didn't really like that. So <laughs> I said, I'm going to quit. My colleagues persuaded me to stay on and said, if you have an assistant, will you be OK? So I became a co-chair for a couple of years, but even that didn't work. So finally, I gave it all up. And now I'm still on faculty, but I have no administrative responsibilities. So I can apply my trade yeah. <laughs> with ease. <laughs> did the school crisis, um, how did the school crisis leave you feeling about white people? Well, you know, early on in life, I tried to figure out what was going on here. I was about eight, nine years old. I thought, you know, there must be an explanation for this stuff. But nobody seemed to know the answers. Nobody seemed to know. So I thought, OK, I'll figure it out myself. I did my research. <laughs> and I concluded when I was about nine that the white people were crazy, just absolutely insane. That seemed to make sense. But that didn't last very long. I mean, I had to give that thought up because I couldn't find any ongoing signs of mental illness. You know? There's, there seemed to be, these were missing. But what was going on was a definite penchant for continuing to make decisions based on race. Institutions were developed with race in mind. Programs were developed with race in mind. Everything had race at its base. So I thought, oh, OK, I wouldn't do it this way, but this is the way it's done. Uh, I never developed any antipathy toward white people. I thought they were misguided, uninformed, unwilling to give up the privilege of being white. From their position, and I would look at it from their point of view, I could see the efficacy of maintaining that. You know, here you have an opportunity to garner all of the perquisites from society based on whiteness. Why not keep that? What would be the reason to give it up? Couldn't find any. Couldn't find any reason to give that up. But I thought at some point, if I or somebody else could come up with a formula so that people could see the need to incorporate other folk and still not lose anything, maybe that would work. Still working on that, by the way. <laughs> uh, but then another thing that happened along the way, my mom helped me figure this one out when I was quite young. She said, Terry, you don't have enough life capital to expend on hatred. Hatred cost a great deal. When you hate, you pay the cost. And honestly, you don't have it. You have enough capital, a life capital, to sustain you for perhaps 80 years. Uh, she pointed out that that was about the average human lifespan, 0 to 80. She said, now, if you want to make the best use of your 80 years, you better husband that capital and use it in ways to enhance your growth and your well-being. Don't expend it lavishly on hatred. Made sense. So I said, OK. And it works. So I don't have to hate people. And it's, it's really nice. <laughs> um, I know that you have uh, done some work for the Little Rock School District um, over the past decade. Um, what's it, I mean, what do you think about the state of education in Little Rock now? Is it what you were hoping it would be or not? Um. Well, you know, Little Rock actually could be seen as a microcosm of the entire country. We, as a collective, do not really understand what education is all about. I'm convinced of that. Because I, I think if we really understood the power of education and the value of education, we would do something entirely different. Right now, unfortunately, our focus is on standardized testing, which is absolutely uh, insane, has nothing to do with education. But um, 
I don't know how that's all going to shift and change. I was on a panel once for the Los Angeles Unified School District, and the panel members were becoming increasingly dissatisfied with my responses until finally, in exasperation, they said, okay, what would you do to change this to make it better? I said, well, I would just blow it up. Get rid of it. It's worthless. You don't need it. Blow it up and then take all school-age children and send them out of the country for two years. Stamp their visas, cannot return for two years. I said, it's vital that they begin to expand their understanding of what it means to be global citizens. Meanwhile, during that two-year period, people who really had a vested interest in education would come together and figure out what sort of system needs to be put in place. And I said, at the base of that system would be ability to think critically, to analyze data and information, and come to conclusions not based on sound bites and stereotypic information or your own assumptions, but on that critical analysis. In order to do that, we have to really figure out how to help these kids confront information and understand what it's saying to them. We don't do that right now. They were not happy with me. Um, I have always thought that true education, which is not what you get in these formal institutions, but true education where individuals understand the need to know the options available to them in the universe. See, once you know what the options are, then your range of choices expands. And if your range of choices expands, you're in much better shape than somebody who has no clue what the options are. You know? I see young people today who, who think <laughs> their options are limited to uh, very, very few things. You know? It's really sad mm -hmm. because they, they put a great deal of emphasis on wearing uh, shoes by Nike, for instance. I mean, kids in LA have been killed mm -hmm. because they've been wearing a pair of Nikes that somebody else wants very badly. That's a poor option to have in life, you know. But uh, to get kids to think beyond that, I've worked with gangs in, in LA, for instance, got called in as a psychologist to try and help these kids see things differently. They have such limited vision, mm -hmm. you know. They have this concept of protecting turf. And turf, in their estimate, is sometimes a, a city block. This is our turf. And I tried to engage them in some discussion about ownership. I said, now, you're calling this your turf, but you really don't own this. Eventually, they had to agree, you know, we, we don't. So why not? Wouldn't it be make more sense to protect something that you really own? Uh, they weren't happy to hear that sort of thinking, mm. you know, because they get caught up in the rhetoric of gangsterism. <laughs> which has no, again, it's irrational, illogical. Uh, I, I didn't have very much success, uh, honestly. But I think at some point I would like to try it again. And I would, I would probably use different uh, approaches in the beginning to gain their trust and understanding. Because when I went in first, I wasn't so concerned about that. I just wanted them to know things. You know? And I found out that that just can't happen. <laughs> you, know, you have to have windows of opportunity when they're ready to learn then maybe, maybe you can do something, but yeah. So this trip to Little Rock um, is uh, a positive one, and um, so tomorrow you get to help dedicate a statue of you and the other eight uh, on the grounds of the, of the state capitol. What are your feelings about that? Well, you know, it's been very interesting because uh, in this country, we uh, generally like symbols. We rally around symbols. We have the flag, we have the eagle, you know, we have the dollar. We, <laughs> we, uh, we like those things. And I think this, this set of statues, these nine statues, will be symbolic as well. It will have different meaning to different mm -hmm. people. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, it will stand as a, as a permanent symbol that we can sort of see as a marker in space and time. And for me, it's, a, it's an important marker because it sort of balances some of the markers from 1957. We have the images of the mobs mm -hmm. out in opposition. And now we have these statues that say, here are the kids you were opposed to. Why would you have done that? It's time for reflection, time for rethinking. Uh, it will also be a time for some folk to deface 
Uh, you know, in the name of, we don't like this. And I anticipate that. Uh, but that's, that's how it is. After all, this is America. <laughs> um, anything else that you would like to add? Well, uh, I think, you know, one of the things I heard when I was a first grader comes to mind. Miss Waugh was my teacher at Gibbs Elementary. Wonderful woman. She told us first graders, she said, you know what, kids, you have to become the executives in charge of your own education. You've got to be the executives who understand what you need to learn. And honestly, we didn't know what she was talking about. But eventually, as she kept repeating it, it began to make sense. She saw herself not as the educator, but she saw us as the people who had to take primary responsibility for that. And I have always appreciated her having done that because for me it meant opening up a whole new world. Mm -hmm. I did not have to wait around for folk to teach me stuff. I could go learn it. That made all the difference. So I would suggest to anybody who sees this tape, take on executive responsibility for learning. You'll see the difference. Good. Well, thank you very all much. Right. This has been great. All right. Did you get that tape running, Amanda? Screen fades That's to black. That's all right. I have no technical expertise either. A blue screen appears with the words play. Screen fades once more to show white noise static on the background. Arrowhead of the National Park Service appears Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site with accompanying social media handles and logos.